So, we are here with two very extraordinary and very historic Ferraris. Uh, and the Ferrari story is very well known to the world. It's one of the world's most recognizable brands and something uh, for which millions of people across the world have a great passion. These are two Ferraris from the earliest days of Ferraris. And Don, tell us what it is about these two cars that first attracted you to them. Uh, I love history. You know, and I love the history of how things are created, and and Enzo was, you know, kind of a brilliant uh, mastermind of how to create a car company to race and sell cars. But he didn't really care about selling cars; he really cared about racing. And so, both these cars are very early. Uh, this is the twenty uh, third road Ferrari built, the dark blue one. And the other one is a race car 126A. Uh, and they look similar because at that time, both these cars were designed by Touring. And I love the Touring lines. I love how he takes the fender line and then extends it all the way down. But if you look at these cars from the front, the blue car looks happy, like it's smiling. The red car looks very aggressive. And that was their personalities. So, so this is one of the very first road cars. This is a very early race car. Uh, it's one of two built by Turing as a Berlinetta. Uh, it's all aluminum and plastic with a tremendous engine in it. This one's very easy to drive. This has 120 horsepower. This had over 300 horsepower. And I just love what they represent. So, you know, I, you know, I feel like we just preserved these cars, and it's something that needs to be preserved so people understand it. One of the things that uh, attracts me to cars like this is the very concept of the fact that they are very designed for a purpose. They're designed to accomplish uh, their work on the track or on the road, uh, and are built very, very specifically to not get in the way of what it is that they're designed to do. They're elemental, in a way. Well, they're very elemental. The, the red car is about as elemental as you could get. With the time it raced, uh, originally it weighed 1,800 pounds back in the 1950s. It had, uh, at the time, it had about 320 horsepower at the flywheel, over 270 horsepower at the rear wheels, and it weighed 1,800 pounds with 1951 brakes, 1951 s steering, uh, and suspension. So it is a handful to drive. Where the blue car has 120 horsepower, it actually weighs more, and is more for driving in a much more spirited but leisurely fashion than a race car. So it didn't beat up the occupants or anything else. So they're very specific, and even though they look similar, they're completely different to drive. Like you said, they're very elemental especially the red cars. <laughs> and a point that you made, which is a very important one, is the fact that Enzo Ferrari, from the time that he ran the Alpha racing department before World right. War II, uh, through this period after the war when he had started his own company, was very much concentrated on competition. That was his deal. And he sold cars to the public, both to race and for the road mm -hmm. and to help pay for right. his own racing program. Now, the uh, 166, which has a very elegant uh, Carrozzeria Touring body, looks like a car that you could just get dressed up in your finest and drive on a leisurely basis to the opera, but it's not quite as refined as a driving experience as it might look. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, it, there were owners, uh, a lot of owners didn't care about the uh, sensibility of this was a, a racing car and this is a a uh, uh, touring car, a lot of owners would take a 166 like this, called an Inter, and they would race them. They'd do hill climbs, they'd go down to the track, and so these cars were also raced quite extensively by their owners, even though they weren't designed to be an all-out race car like the red one. Well, it's one of the things, too, that uh, in Italian, I know that you are a great fan of Italian culture and history in mm. addition to Italian cars. And, and food. And the food. <laughs> there, there's a great spirit in Italy of, of competition and adventure. Uh, a daily drive is something to be savored, not something to simply be rushed through, just like a great Italian meal. Yeah, I, I, I described uh, driving in Italy 
you know, I, I told uh, Carol, I said, every day it's like a Mr. Toad's wild ride. I mean, you have no idea where the cars are going to come from. They come at you in all the different directions. Uh, it's, it's just wild over there. But the one thing that defines Ferrari for me, and I think even back in the day, is passion. And, and you go to the Ferrari factory and you look at the history and you look at how they build the cars and the enthusiasm of the workers. And you think none of these workers will be, ever be able to afford a new Ferrari. But they love these cars. They're all hand built. Uh, and, and you understand why they're you know, quite a bit more expensive because there's no robots building them. There's no uh, you know, mechanical production line. Everything is made almost by hand. They make their own uh, engine blocks and everything. And, and you just sense this passion about the people there. And I've been to a lot of car tours, factory tours, and I've never seen anything like that. And that's what, you know, that's what Ferrari of all the brands there really represents passion. And that continues to today because Ferrari is one of the few brands that has always been involved in competition at all points in its history. Right. So even today when you see a brand new Ferrari on the road, you think about Ferrari in Formula One, you think about Ferrari at Le Mans, you think about Ferrari in all of these races. Um, coming back to these two cars and the fact that they are early cars, you, you have a, a very interesting and very v varied <laughs> collection, uh, mostly Italian, although sort of half divided between Italian and German, mm. so the Alps get in the way of your collecting a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, the, uh, when you first saw one of these cars, however many decades it might have been, A, did you imagine that you would own one, two of them, and what did you expect them to be like, and what did the reality turn out to be? You know, I never thought I'd own these kinds of cars. I mean, it's a, uh, it's kind of a disease. You know, get this disease, and I never thought I'd have as many cars as we have now. Uh, and so you, and and luckily, Carol, my wife, has caught the disease too. So, so it's not something we clash about. And the only time we clash is when I want to sell something, and she goes, "No, you can't sell it." So, so uh, we have an, a lot of different things. Uh, but I say. Italian cars, you know, really represent style. I mean, it's even their most elemental race cars had a style about it. And you look at the German cars, and we have a lot of German cars and a number of German race cars. And, you know, you look at a 356, it could have been built in 51 or it could have been built in 65, and you look at it and they look the same basically. But you look at a 51 Ferrari, you look at a 65 Ferrari, it, you can't even tell other than looking at the badges because they're all individually styled and they have passion. And what always amazed me is when you see some of the fabulous race cars from the 50s and the 60s, how beautiful they were. I mean, not only were they functional, but they were beautiful. Uh, you know, and he used lots of different designers in the early days. This was touring. Um, who has the best badge, I think, of all the car manufacturers or body designers. He has the most fabulous badge. Touring stopped working for him in 52 or 53 because he was, wasn't getting paid fast enough and he was afraid he was going to go out of business. <laughs> so that's when uh, Ferrari then settled on Pina Farina to make the majority of his body. So the early touring bodies are really rare. And one of the things that you bring up is also a very interesting point, which is the fact that like the great manufacturers of the 1920s and 30s and the 40s, Ferrari did not build their own bodies until quite no. recently uh, when they really uh, bought in uh, the Scaglietti works and began constructing their own bodies. And like the cars of the 1930s, you bought a chassis from Ferrari. Right. And then you went to a coach builder, whether it be uh, Vignale, Touring, Pininfrina, Ghia, whoever it might be, to, to clothe your car. And so what makes these cars also so incredibly interesting for me, and I know for you because you really appreciate the aesthetic, is the fact that this is an aesthetic collaboration. You have this, these amazing mechanicals and this great engine built by Enzo Ferrari. I won't say a great chassis because people would argue that the great chassis came along with the 250, which we'll talk about later. Um, but, and then clothed in these incredibly <sighs> beautiful and sensual and, and, and just communicative shapes. And then when you think of the, these two bodies, the touring bodies, they were all hand formed. I mean, they had, these were all hand made with 
uh, aluminum workers hammering away to shape the bodies. They, you know, it wasn't, there was no automated anything, cutting or anything else. And you look and they're just marvelous. So, and, uh, in, like you said, back in the 30s, you order a high-end car. You know, you know, some high-end cars did have a body manufacturer affiliate with them, but most of them went to other uh, body makers or designers. And Ferrari kept that up till uh, you know, he finally chose Pininfarina to do most of the designs. But like you said, the bodies were still made there. And it's uh, also a very interesting thing that something which we've come to associate as the Ferrari look, the, the great egg crate grill, <laughs> is a touring right. design detail. Yeah, touring is. And uh, so it is, uh, uh, it can be stated uh, arguably that touring really sort of established the look of Ferrari and Pininfarina took what touring had started in terms of a feeling and refined it and made it something that was a, uh, a, a slightly, well, one of the things that uh, people often say that, uh, and this is probably an apocryphal tale, that one of the other reasons why Enzo Ferrari went to Pininfarina was because the Pininfarina designs were a lot cleaner and simpler. And so people didn't immediately walk up to the car and say, oh, wow, look at that car. He wanted them to say, wow, it's a Ferrari. Right. Well. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would guess that Vignali is the was the height of Art Deco and a lot of uh, uh, exterior uh, things just for the look versus functionality. Uh, but these cars were all beautifully functional too. Um, I think what a lot of uh, people see Ferrari today doesn't understand how few cars they built back in these days. So the this uh, 166. I think they made 23 of them over the years. So 23 was their output for road cars. <laughs> you know, so very, very few cars. And I think uh, that Enzo was quite happy to have sold 23. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. That was a terrific thing. Yeah. Kept and, them and, racing yeah. another day. <laughs> exactly. That's what he wanted, right? Racing. And then I, should, I think he's pretty happy when people would buy a car that was a road car, but also race it mostly in Italy is where it took place. I uh, asked a question um, when I was writing an, an article a few years ago, and I asked uh, Luigi Canetti Jr., the son of Luigi Canetti, the great Ferrari driver uh, who brought them their first victory at Le Mans with a 166 and uh, then established Ferrari as a brand in the United mm -hmm. States, um, what it was like for his father to sell cars. How did he market these cars? And he said, well, Ferrari only built about 40 cars in a year, and if you couldn't find 23 people to sell them to, you didn't need to be in business. So, <laughs> which is an interesting uh, way to put it. But it's also quite interesting in that, as you said, people bought race cars from Ferrari to race. They also bought the road cars, which they occasionally used in competition as well. Um, but there were also those people who simply wanted the style to be associated with a grand touring or a racing car. What do you think, if you were a young man of means uh, in 1952 and uh, oh. you were 23 years old and said, I want, a, I want a fast, fancy car, could you have imagined yourself in one of these back then? If I was a, a person of means? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's great to be a person of means. <laughs> However, I wasn't, so. <laughs> no, I, wouldn't you? I mean, you like, if you like something like style or, I mean, you know, I, th I think cars and the uh, let's say the affection uh, you know I have for cars uh, or Carol has for cars and other car collectors that we both know I mean it, it is kind of a disease you either have it or you don't you know if you don't have it you can go buy a Prius and be happy but but if you have it you want you know something that's beautiful that's stylist that that has evokes passion in you when you see it I mean you know uh, I look at the cars I always get a smile when I look at them Right? I mean, it's, it's like rolling art, but it's, you know, it brings you uh, joy to look at them. This is an important uh, point I wanted to bring up. <clears throat> unfortunately, I spend a lot of my time, I make, not unfortunately, I'm very fortunate that I make my living largely valuing cars. And the value of cars is a topic which has become right. more and more to the fore. And as a collector, who has been fortunate enough to amass a group of cars which are extraordinary cars in terms of the history, in terms of their aesthetic, in terms of their performance, but they're also now have become quite valuable. Right. Does the value of the car affect the way you use your cars? 
Uh, I would say for the most part, no. Uh, uh, one is we never, uh, if you looked around, none of the cars here that we bought, we bought because we thought they were going to increase in value. You know, all the cars I bought, I was hoping they wouldn't go down in value. So I, I'd look for something rare or something to, hoping they'll keep its value, not go crazy and go up in value. Um, you know, there's few exceptions. There's a, we have one car that has 700 miles on it. So we don't drive that on the street because if it got in an accident, you can repair it, but you can never put it back to be an original 700 mile car. These cars, we drive, we drive on the streets. Uh, we're careful we're not trying to drive during rush hour traffic or anything else. And one of the other cars we'll look at, uh, the Super America, you know, Carol and I took that on a rally uh, on a Memorial Day weekend, and we were stuck in stop and go traffic on the San Diego Freeway leaving Orange County to go into the hills. And she kept getting worried because, you know, it's stop and go traffic. And, and I said, don't worry about it, you know, it can always be fixed. And, and, and so we still drive them, you know. You know, the, the only ones, I would say the exceptions that we have to be really careful with are the original cars that have never been restored, never been painted. Those you have to be more, uh, because of the value, you, you can't be stupid about it and say, well, you know, you know, ah, so why if I get an accident and it loses $2 million of value, you know, so we, that we don't do. But the other cars we all drive. Well, that's a great thing to hear because I know it's one of the things, frankly, that I think has, has drawn the, the two of us and, and, of course, Carol as well, uh, together. Uh, as, as to become friends in this is because we share a philosophy of what these cars mean and how they should be used. The people who are watching this video are seeing these cars in an art gallery and they are art. They are incredible sculpture, but they're kinetic sculpture. To, to smell them and to hear them and to see the light pass across them, that's what really brings them to life. In, in one collector, very well-known collector, said the reason it's so exciting to drive these old cars is you don't know if you'll get back or not. So, so it's not like today, you know, where everything is in these new cars is so perfect. These cars are, you know, these cars are old race cars. Some of their parts are 60 years old, 70 years old. And so you drive them out and you don't know what's going to happen. And, and it does lend an element of uh, excitement that you wouldn't have in a new car. Excitement and involvement. Right. You mentioned that uh, in, in another part of our conversation, the fact that it's a very involving driving experience to, to, to take one of these cars out into the road because they don't drive themselves. You're aware of how the road moves, how the car moves as it, as it warms up, as the temperature changes, as, as the fuel level changes. Everything affects the way you drive the car. And that's got to make a difference to you. Right. But, the, you know, like the red car, the 120, 126A, the 340 market, it does try to drive itself. <laughs> okay. It has so much power and it's so light that it tries to take different uh, lanes when you don't want it to. Uh, if you're not alert, you'll be off the road so fast. And, and it always amazes me that people race these. Uh, you know, Ferrari, uh, we were back at Ferrari and they're showing me the build sheets on the car and everything. And, and the, the guy that mentioned, he says, oh, this is a Le Mans car. And I didn't know that. So I just found that out two weeks ago. So, so this car was driven in the 24 hours of Le Mans race in, uh, in France, where two, two drivers by regulation have to share the racing, although depending on who right. the entrant was, sometimes one driver drove for yeah. 20 hours and the other one drove for four. But the true sporting heroes that drove a car like this and cars like these for 24 hours without rest on the Mille Miglia for an entire day, a thousand miles across Italy on roads that are not really surfaced in a terrific way, around Sicily in, in the Targa, Targa, Targa Florio. Florio. I mean, these are real heroes. Well, there's a th theory about this because if you drive these cars, it's you know, in reality, it was so dangerous to race these cars, right? I mean, the the percentage of world-class race drivers that survived five years was very low. Now, the theory is that a lot of the drivers back in the 50s to drive these, you know, say very dangerous but exciting cars, you know, they survived World War II. And a lot of, a lot of them were have been flyers or tank commanders or something, and they probably didn't think they would survive World War II. So for them, continuing taking these risks was a way more natural 
than growing up in today's world where everybody wants to make sure everybody's safe. You know, so, so I mean, of all the cars we have, this is probably the most scary car to drive. It's exhilarating because the power is unbelievable, but it's a scary car to drive. You have to be on top of it the whole time. And this, uh, this exhibition is called Ferrari and Futurists, an Italian look at speed. And of course, the Futurist manifestos really celebrated the idea of speed and, and danger and, and what it brought to man in elevating his life. And I think that a car like this 340 yeah. exemplifies that, don't you? Oh, I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. And it's so rare because there's only two of them. Uh, and this is the only one that appears to have been built with a, a dry sump, which meant it was always going to be a, a, a full race car. Uh, and it's you know, the only one existing right now. So, it's well, it's a, great, uh, it's a great responsibility and also it's got to be a great thrill to be the caretaker of these cars. And uh, I know that this is something that you and Carol love and relish and we're also extremely happy that you share these cars yes. with the public as much as you do because that's also, I think, so much a part of this. We took you out for a ride in that and I was wondering if you're going to come back scared or not. You know. Well, the disappointment was that you didn't put me behind the wheel because we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, I'd probably be in jail or someplace in Canada, wherever I've gotten with the car. Oh, <laughs> or Mexico is closer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks.